Hello, I'm Gary Stearman. I have a really good guest today. His name's Ken Johnson. And Ken and I, when we start talking, uh, f find ourselves uh, kind of s twisting and spinning off into, s into the worlds of the Bible. And there are many, many of those. And, and Ken has done uh, the kind of digging that very few people have the patience to do. Ken, welcome to Prophecy Watchers. And uh, tell everybody your favorite reading material. My favorite reading material these days are the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, mm -hmm. okay. okay. Admit it, most of you would be bored stiff. Dead Sea Scrolls, even if I knew the language, I wouldn't understand it. And, and I th yeah, but Ken digs into the Dead Sea and has for how many years now? I've been doing it probably three and a half years. And you have found things, that, quite frankly, that were not uh, popularly known Maybe yes. not known at all, and brought them to us in your books, and I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, I have before me one of uh, Ken's books, and this one is a little different. This is called Fallen Angels, and in this book you sort of uh, alphabetically catalog angels. In mm. some ways you uh, alphabetically catalog them, in other ways you, you catalog them by what they do, by their history, and so forth and so on. But Fallen angels, what a topic. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you begin that topic when you open the Bible? Well, looking at the Bible and the scrolls, you basically have a history of three falls. There's Lucifer and those fallen angels, Azazel's fall, and then the Genesis 6 account, which is the 200 angels that fell, and then the history of what they did. And so that's in the first part. The last part is the uh, kind of a dictionary. So if there's specific words that refer to certain types of angels or what they did, then I thought that was interesting to know. What is interesting to you as you study fall, fallen angels? What do you think we gain by uh, uh, or through an understanding of what, who they are, where they came from, who they obey, what they do? Uh, what do we have to gain from that? Well, I think in, in all those things, any time you can learn something about anything, it may help. And we want to understand the Bible and prophecy and salvation and those things. And if angels par uh, play a part in there anyway, the more we know about them, the better. Now, I'm just going to open this to, uh, well, Abaddon. A, Abaddon. And then I have a reference here. Uh, C, reference to the angel of the bottomless pit. So Abaddon is uh, a... Uh, a, an angel who's going to play a, a very powerful role at some point in our future, but he also has a past. Yes. <clears throat> and you cover that. Yes, try to as much as I can. We want to eliminate any of the speculation or any medieval text and just go back to Dead Sea Scrolls, Church Fathers, and the Bible. Now here's something, Eblis. <laughs> just a you wouldn't, you've never heard that word before, have you? Well, but Ken has got it here. Eblis, meaning despair. A name for Satan in Arabic lore. <clears throat> Though they have him as a jinn rather than a fallen angel. Let's talk about fallen angels. Here you make reference to a, uh, an angel, a fallen one, in, in Arabic lore, which kind of leads you on in your thinking to fallen angels in general. What's the history of fallen angels uh, briefly as we have it in the Bible? Well, first we have the whole concept of Lucifer's fall and the angels that fell with him. So that's one group and you need to study who they are, why they fell, what they were wanting to do, what they're trying to do now. But then you have a history most people understand of Genesis 6, uh, the, uh, the Nephilim, that kind of stuff. And we've got Dead Sea Scrolls like the Book of Enoch, Book of Jubilees, Book of Giants. There's numerous quotes from the Church Fathers that kind of fill in the history about the civil wars that happened pre-flood. And we actually have a good amount of pre-flood history. And so when you study the 200, you realize there's a small break in there. And first there was an angel named Azazel and his fall. And then there was the 200. Now, uh, for those who may not be familiar, the 200, you speak of the 200. Where do we hear about them? Uh, they're in the Book of Enoch, Book specifically. Of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch has been 
uh, recently discovered in the last two or three centuries. In mm -hmm. other words, it doesn't go way, way back, right? Or it does, except that we have, had not found it until fairly recently. Right, we have the history and the legends behind it, but most people don't believe history anymore. And so you've got <laughs> the Ethiopic version, and yeah. so their question is, did the Ethiopians just make it up, you know? But it was found, parts of it were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So again, that makes it at least two, three hundred years before the Ethiopians put it in their canon. And by the way, that book is quoted in our New Testament. Yes. Uh, and in, by Jude. And the part that's quoted has to do with the, 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 the fallen ones and, and mm -hmm. those who came down. And Enoch uh, goes into great detail about how they came down uh, to a mountaintop just north of Israel. And they came down determined <clears throat> to overtake the world. What kind of a job did they do? A fairly good one. They basically created the Nephilim and that spawned three major clans, the Nephal, the Giants, and the Elu. Then the Lord, in judgment, sent a civil war to destroy everything, but all flesh had been corrupted. And when you read about the names of these angels, oftentimes those names are picked up and you see them in scripture in various places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know about the scapegoat, for instance, uh, yes. one of the Jewish rituals. It says scapegoat in a King James. The actual Hebrew word is the Azazel goat, and it has to do with the, with the fallen angel Azazel. And Azazel <coughs> came down out of heaven somehow with the determination to overtake the world, mm -hmm. to create a revolution. And his name then was applied to the scapegoat. Tell everybody how, how the scapegoat figured in, in uh, Israelite. Uh, the, the ritual is that you, you take a scapegoat and put his sins on him, take him 12, uh, 12 miles basically outside of Jerusalem to a specific place. It's called uh, Bet Hadudo. And you kill the goat and it's, it's done in a certain ritual on Yom Kippur. And if it was done correctly, the scarlet thread turned white and there were some miracles associated with it. But it basically talks about the whole idea that sin is ascribed to Azazel, all the, the problems. And historically what had happened was, according to the text, Azazel had came down, tried to create his own uh, children, if you will, or, or recreate uh, earth in his image. And he did apparently a really good job because the Azazel people, children, were different than the others. But they kind of kept to themselves. It didn't destroy a whole bunch of stuff. Kind of like if you went to an island and recreated it and stayed uh -huh. away from society. But then the 200 decided they wanted to do the same. And they came down and that's when everything was really corrupted. And so Azazel has a history. He, ha he has, has a personality and his name and his actions uh, prominently color uh, the, the history of the Israelites mm -hmm. because he's always held up as the scapegoat. The sins of the 12 tribes are placed upon Azazel right. and he's chased into the wilderness. So you're reenacting the destruction of Azazel who is a fallen angel and he's only one of many, many, many such fallen angels. You know, and that's a one good reason why we need to study the Jewish rituals. Not that we're supposed to do them, but if they teach something, we don't want to just do a ritual, you know, like whatever. Yeah. We want to know why is the ritual like that? What are we supposed to learn from it? Because if we've forgotten the history, there's no use in doing the ritual. But remember in Revelation, there are, at a certain point, there are the Euphrates River dries up and four mighty angels come out that are currently yes. chained. So if you believe the text, believe the Bible, these things are not symbolic. They're actually literal. So there really is a, a Ken Johnson, there's a Gary Stearman, there's an Azazel. Well, we have uh, something I think most of you will be familiar with. We have Leviathan here. <clears throat> and he's mentioned in Job and Isaiah and Revelation. And he's kind of a dragon-like character. And his figure is seen in many Eastern religions to this very day, worshiping of the dragon. Yes. It's interesting because the, the Leviathan is supposed to be a seven-headed red dragon, and many cultures in the Middle East, not just the Hebrews, but many of them, look at that as a picture of an evil empire at the end of time. And we see that in the book of Revelation, the seven-headed red dragon. Yes. Yeah, and that, so that those dragon represents the powers of Earth. 
mm-hmm. that are re- have rebelled against God. And mm-hmm. so, and so it's fascinating. Uh, you have Lilith here. Now, mm-hmm. Lilith is female. Yes. And you talk about Lilith in the book. Let's, let's talk about her for a moment. Lilith, what, what is she? Well, fallen angels are all masculine. Uh, that's very clearly taught in scripture. But when you get a fallen angel to come down and create Nephilim, your, your children, however you do it, genetic tampering or whatever, then you have males and females. They reproduce just like cats, dogs, humans, everything else. So if the Nephilim are destroyed, the spirits are still around, but they used to be male or female. So fallen angels always male, but demons, which are the spirits of the Nephilim, not fallen angels, are male or female. And that's a specific uh, fallen, or not fallen angel, but a specific demon named Lilith, actually mentioned in Isaiah. And I use the King James all the time, so the King James actually translates it screech owl, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's <laughs> it like, yeah, it's not the word for owl, but yeah. It is not. What uh, Ken has done is what he does so well, uh, going, goes back into old manuscripts and pulls out interesting details, collects them so that you can read about them without, without having to go through hundreds of pages of materials, historical materials, some of which are difficult to understand. But this one on the fallen angels, I think, uh, interests me mostly because we war against the dark side. The mm-hmm. whole New Testament is about that war and about victory through Jesus. And that war continues to this very day. Mm-hmm. And in a way, it helps us to understand that, hey, there are these fallen ones. Uh, Satan has his principalities and powers and rulers of, of uh, darkness in heavenly places and so forth. And they're all fallen ones who still follow a fallen leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess the number one fallen angel would be Satan himself, who right. had the form of that dragon we were talking about. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. The, we, we call him Lucifer because that's the King James word out of, Is- I think it's Isaiah 14. The Hebrew word is actually Halel, which I guess would be his proper name. Okay. Which Halel. has some really interesting connotations to it. <laughs> And I really find it amazing that uh, there are people on earth today who worship the dragon. Yeah. I mean, why would you do that? A death wish? <laughs> or It's kind of weird. You really, at, at this point in your life, believe that the dragon is the powerful one. Hmm. He is the god of the heavens. Now, he would like you to believe that. He sort of still thinks of himself in that way, and we all remember the time when <clears throat> Jesus... I had a, if you will, a conversation with Satan, with the old dragon, the wicked one. And the conversation was all about uh, the dragon telling Jesus how much of the world that he wanted for his own personal property. And, uh, and it was sort of like, how much are you going to give me, Jesus? And Jesus said, wait a minute. I have to tell you something, and he did. And that conversation is recorded, but it's just a little piece of the fight that has gone on for so many years mm-hmm. and still goes on. Uh, and but I think in the near future, it's going to that battle is going to be closed out once and for all, and we're going to be part of it, victorious in Jesus. But still, it's kind of interesting to look at a book like Ken's and say. Hmm, so that's how that got its name, or so that's how yeah. that happened. Yeah, and some people might say, why would we want to study that? That's a yeah. little creepy. But if you think about it, a doctor studies bacteria, studies the disease so that you can do a cure. Uh, if we have an enemy that's trying to destroy us, we need to figure out what his tactics are. So you need to study your enemy just a little bit. But always focus on the Messiah. Always. <clears throat> and by the way, I can testify to that, having read Ken's books for many years, and, and uh, keep up the good work, by the way. Uh, you look where nobody else thinks to look, and uh, in the little dark corners of manuscripts and histories and things like that. And I'm glad there are people like you around doing their work. I'm just way too curious to quit. <laughs> Ken, may the Lord bless you and your work. Thank you. I'm Gary Stearman. And you're watching Prophecy Watchers. Hey, you keep watching. We are.